With more evidence becoming available, scientists in multiple countries are investigating an issue that was previously taken for granted, the origin of COVID-19. Some scientists said initial evidence showed that COVID-19 may have gone unnoticed before December 2019. In fact, the World Health Organization is on top of it. They assembled a team of 10 global scientists to find out if there are other known origins than Wuhan, China. The Lenson is doing the same. Will their research tell us something we do not already know? Joining us for discussion from D.C. is Eric Ding, Senior Fellow at the Federation of American Scientists. And here in Beijing, Einar Tengen, Current Affairs Commentator. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Eric, let me go to you first in Washington, D.C. So far, what more details do we know about the studies undertaken by the WHO as well as the Lancet? Well, I think they're doing these further surveys of how and how early um, the virus was spreading. And there's still a lot of uncertainty because, you know, there's the CDC also carried out a study of blood samples and uh, traced it back to December. And Italy's previous wastewater study traced it also to December outside of China. So the, in terms of the origin story, there's more and more uh, in this new study, they altogether add evidence that this started before Wuhan. Wuhan was just the first outbreak in a major city, but I think worldwide this was spread much, much earlier. And there's still still a lot of speculation about um, when and where it started because we do not have an animal host. The closest animal, um, the bat beta coronavirus, is an equivalent of 20 years of natural evolution. And that is a very long time of a gap and so this is why we still have to hunt down. And hunting down is really important for preventing the next pandemic. Uh, Einer, what is your understanding on these investigations? Uh, what do you expect to find out uh, more about the origin of COVID-19? Well, let's take a, just understand a little bit about the differences between the studies. You know, the WHO is taking this purely from a science point of view. They're, uh, they're virologists. This is forensic virology. That means that you're going back and literally studying, and this is the time to start doing it. You, you want to get as close as you can to patient zero. You want to know, you know, uh, where, how, uh, when, all of these things. And as, as my uh, colleague said, it's all about understanding the origins, the crossover, and how you can prevent in the future. Then you have what the Lancet is doing, which is very much more multidisciplinary. Uh, it's being headed up by Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, there's an environmental foundation, and what they're doing is they have 12 individuals who are from very, very different fields, and they're taking a holistic look at this, especially the crossover uh, dangers that are out there. You know, for instance, people still talk about civet cats and the original SARS virus, but in actuality, they found out that the civet cats got it when they went to the market. They didn't have it before. So the, the, there's a lot of complexity. You would never know exactly for certain. But, you know, given that uh, this uh, COVID-19 was showing up even in France in September of 2019, mm -hmm. it, it says that this is a much more complex uh, situation. And also, you know, there's these, they think that the, the virus may, may have changed, uh, may have, um, you know, gone differently, but it's also possible that there were two different variants of this to begin with. So at this time, it, it, this is the appropriate time, not when it breaks out, to start figuring out how you can head off the next uh, pandemic. So Eric Ding, uh, let me put it bluntly. Um, do you think it is uh, not a foregone conclusion uh, that uh, the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is from Wuhan? I think everything's on the table. I, I don't think Wuhan, it could have still started from Wuhan, but just spread throughout the world faster because it takes a while to build up. So it doesn't exclude anything. Every option is still on the table, including the, uh, some of the more absurd uh, and more extreme uh, options that I won't mention. So this is why it, it, tr finding the smoking gun animal reservoir uh, in which the virus had come from, the nearest closest cousin, because a 20-year gap is just so large. And w without further data to fill in that gap, we want to find the closest cousin of which there was a half a year or one year evolution difference. That would be really key. And, you know, th there's so many variants now in the world, and we see that there's there are mutations. The 
D614G version we now know is much more infectious than the old um, Wuhan strain. And we know it's still continuing to mutate, sometimes for worse, sometimes um, more neutral. But this is why the virus moves very quickly and we have to pinpoint and everything is on the table. Einer, uh, what would you, how would you respond to the critics saying that uh, now it is really a race, a time, uh, you know, uh, racing against time uh, to find a cure for the disease, meaning the rollout of vaccines that is more important than, uh, you know, trying to find out uh, the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic? Oh, well, quite frankly, the people who are involved in uh, doing this are not the ones who are going to come up with the, the cures. So this idea that you're, you're taking time and resources away from uh, creating a cure, is, is uh, that's completely <laughs> nonsensical. Uh, you have to do this because this is not going to be the only thing. And remember, there have been nine uh, events since uh, SARS. Uh, and they've all been very infectious. These particular studies, at least Lancet's, is starting in 2013 when COVID-2 uh, was discovered and they're trying to find the sequence uh, whether there's some relation to that um, but that gives you an idea we're on COVID-19 right so in between uh, it was sequentially numbered so it, when you start looking at it that way yes absolutely uh, this is not the last time we're going to face this kind of event so if people out there are thinking that once there's a cure to this that's the end of it are, are, are sadly deluded. And, and quite frankly, I, I'm not of one of these people who believes that knowing exactly where it came is that important. What's really important is how to handle uh, cross-species contamination and uh, how to head it off. And that's, it doesn't matter where it comes from. In the end, it's what you do about it. Right. Uh, Eric, uh, you touched upon this a little bit uh, earlier uh, in that scientists uh, you know, in CDC said uh, they have identified antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in samples of blood uh, collected from the U.S. West Coast uh, dating back to December 13th through 16th in 2019. And researchers in France have said they found uh, molecular evidence of the virus in a uh, sample taken from a man hospitalized uh, in December 2019. And Italian scientists uh, said similar things. Basically, they uh, said that they found uh, antibodies in blood samples uh, taken during lung cancer screenings as far back as September 2016. I mean, 19, I think. 2019, I'm sorry about that. Um, what does these uh, findings uh, tell you? Are they evidence enough to say that COVID-19 emerged perhaps simultaneously from multiple locations of the world? Well, first of all, I don't think a virus will converge like that that quickly. Sometimes things will have convergent evolution over centuries. But I think clearly there was a source that was spreading it much earlier. Now, there's still some, con this is what I want to point out, there's still a lot of controversy with that CDC study because um, scientists point out that it can cross-react, that the assay, the, the antibody assay, it can cross-react with other the common cold coronaviruses. So, we haven't fully excluded that possibility mm -hmm. that it could be the cross reaction. And, I, and I'm not familiar with the assays that the French and the Italian would use, but the wastewater study did point to Italy in December. So there's multiple lines of evidence that suggest that it may have been outside of China. Um, but that doesn't mean that it didn't come from China, it's just that it could have leaked out much earlier and built up. In any case, I, you know, I kind of have this feeling that we should we should focus on um, you know finding a treatment and we should sample more because only a very small fraction of all the cases in the world have actually been sampled and genome sequenced. And also, we know that this is also important for reinfection risk because if it's a different strain, um, there has been some studies about about two dozen cases of reinfection that have been confirmed and a couple hundred, 600 cases that are suspected. Mm -hmm. So all these things do affect current potential risks of reinfection if the virus does evolve. I think that, that is what the main question right now is, does the, how quickly the virus evolve affect other things such as reinfection or worse, vaccines? And currently all the vaccines are seem to be okay um, are not affected by the mutations so far. That's good news. Um, I think uh, it would be fair to say that we need to let scientists do their work. Einer, uh, do you think politics is getting in the way of this uh, origin tracing? 
Absolutely. I mean, uh, before everything even started, you had uh, people like Trump and Pompeo claiming this was the China virus, the Wuhan virus. I mean, uh, so destructive, just like his uh, approach to handling it in the U.S. It was a disaster. All he was doing was fermenting kind of racial, uh, you know, <laughs> unrest and things like that. Um, really very unfortunate. This is a scientific thing, and, and quite frankly, we have in the future the kind of tools uh, that will be necessary to do a much better job of this. I mean, uh, imagine 5G, uh, AI, the ability for hospitals to electronically log in the results to a, to a massive database which can then be used to track these things in real time. This would be a huge, huge benefit. Uh, you wouldn't have to do all this kind of forensic, uh, uh, you know, looking back because you would have the record right there in front of you. So, I mean, there, these are the things. Look at the science. Don't pay attention to these idiots who are out there doing this simply because this is good political action for them. Well, let's look forward. Eric, uh, what kind of cooperation would you expect or would you hope uh, the Biden administration will have with China when it comes to, you know, uh, vaccine development or prevention and containment of COVID-19? Well, I think data sharing is really key um, because right now, you know, the samples are not being widely shared from every case individual. Um, in terms of tra uh, sharing data on contact tracing is also really important. And the vaccines, you know, the Chinese uh, um, vaccines are um, based on uh, inactivated vaccines, while the U.S. vaccines tend to be more of the novel mRNA. And we have to really, we have to a collaborate. As in, what if one of them does have mutation? Um, that makes one vaccine better than the other. And some, maybe one vaccine lasts longer than the other. All these things we have to really collaborate because if any of this virus still continues, the whole world is hurt, not just any single country. It's a, it's a pandemic affecting our entire civilization. So I think that kind of data sharing and also potential cooperation on the vaccines of which, or comparatively, which country's vaccines are better and could be shared more easily, I think that is really key. Yeah, hopefully a U.S.-China collaboration on COVID-19 uh, control and uh, containment uh, will happen sooner rather than later. Many thanks to Eric Ding in Washington, D.C. and Anur Tengen in Beijing.